in, in, this, in this lecture, we will talk about static failure theories. Uh, most of the structures that we have, the fact is that they have, uh, they're not only limited to static loading, they, may, they have dynamic loading applied to it, cycling especially, but many times the biggest flaw is to go under the assumption if I can have everything safe for fatigue, uh, cyclic loading will be safe for uh, static loading, and that may, not be, that may not be true and that may not be the case either. So uh, when we talk about static loading, this is what we are really trying to do. The type of problems I am saying that we want to talk uh, are the following. Let's go back to our chart of what we are actually trying to study, what we are trying to do. And when I say it's static, okay, I mean I am saying a particular load that you can apply and you can apply that load over a course of long time. If this is a load F, this load is constant or very close to long constant. It might be changing with time, but over a very short period of time from here, let's say delta T, that delta T tells me that the change in my delta F is very close, is close to zero. So this is a slowly varying function. And a slowly varying function is one that I can basically assume that is constant. Okay? Uh, yes, from a time one to the uh, to a very very long time, you can see there will be a delta delta f, but that delta f is very small when I just take a small delta t. Okay, so if I was to say delta f over delta t, that would give me a, uh, that will basically. Uh, give me e that would be equal to zero and the reason behind it zero is because it's very slowly changing for those type of problems is uh, is where we're going to focus our attention in the next couple of weeks um, we talk about static and so that's what we mean and we will uh, we will see what happens with ductile material behavior and brittle material behavior the uh, behavior is a bit different so let's do a couple of examples and see what uh, other cases have happened failure. This is a very good example of uh, failure of your drive shaft. Uh, this failure is mainly due to corrosion. Um, corrosion plays a huge role, is, especially when you're talking in aerospace structures, uh, in submarines, in, in uh, most of, many, many structures that are subject there uh, to moisture. Uh, galvanic corrosion can be a big thing. You have other type of uh, failure. You can look here, you got a nut here, and you can see the failure around this, how that failure occurred to the material itself. Um, you have a screw. You can see how the screw actually bro broke. We designed, we uh, mechanical engineers, uh, we designed the screws. We decide how the screws are going to be designed. And we have to make sure that they don't go over uh, they don't, uh, they're not subject to this type of failure. Uh, we will learn more about that later as we move on through the semester. Um, this is a good example of aerospace. Uh, this is a window of aerospace structure and what you can see, not sure if it's appreciable, but there is a crack that's been started there and this is what those cracks uh, can look like, in, you know, in, in various circumstances. So, yes, um, there are many other crack. I, I don't know how many of you uh, remember this type of airline. Uh, many many years ago, the ceiling peeled off, and that feeling uh, ceiling peeled off of an airplane, actually through real flight flying time, and it was because small crack originated, and that small crack that was there actually just propagated and opened the whole thing up. So damage, static damage, if you talk about static, is going to have an initial crack. Okay, everything is based on the fact that there is an initial crack and we want to arrest that crack and make sure that it doesn't 
propagate like that. Um, think about these other cases. This is a 1980, uh, 1988 uh, case in which the whole thing uh, blew up. Imagine yourself being on a uh, imagine yourself being on an airplane and all of a sudden your ceiling peels off and you're just wondering what's going to happen. Yes, the bodies don't fly out of the plane. That's that's Hollywood. Uh, uh, but it's dangerous, right? Your your oxygen level is, is is not where it should be. And when you want to land, how do you land? How do you know if you're going to be safe or you're not going to be safe? So that's a major thing when you're designing special planes. Um, and so understanding that this type of study is important, we got two cases. We have brittle and we have ductile materials. Uh, brittle materials behave like this. Uh, a brittle behavior is like a chalk. If you take a chalk and you break the chalk, you can see you're going to have two parts. Um, and maybe like a ceramic, right? You have uh, it's a, a glass, right? You have a glass of water and the glass falls on the floor and it's going to shatter. That's brittle. Ductile behavior, you can think maybe like... Um, uh, like like a paper clip, as for an example. If you take the paper clip and you bend it, it's going to have a failure, but that's called more ductile type of behavior failure because it doesn't break. It doesn't have a stolen break, uh, breaking point. And the reason behind this is when you look at your stress point here, here you have something called sigma yield. Uh, after that sigma yield, after your stresses go, anything you you know have deformation, anything beyond that point. What's going to happen to your structure is going to start to yield, 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 yield until a breaking point. For brittle materials, it just goes up, 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 and all of a sudden just has a uh, almost a sigma ultimate, right? Whereas here, the sigma ultimate is over here. Um, so this is ultimate, and this is just basically breaks. It fails right at that point. It's a sudden failure. So. Um, an example to, to further understand this, you can think of, uh, you know, two parts are separated. Now this is called necking because actually the, the location where the failure is occurring is going to start becoming thinner and thinner and thinner. Um, so, and the reason behind your ductile materials don't have a sudden failure is because they have nothing energy to absorb okay that and this whole area under this curve is called the toughness of the material or it's also known as the, the this is the toughness of this material this is the toughness of a real material you can see that you have less then here you have more energy to absorb the more energy has to absorb uh, the better the material is then I'm going to have a sudden failure which is what we would like to avoid now with composite materials becoming more popular and using in cars, in aerospace industry, we see that that actually can break or they're going to have sudden breaks and uh, failure. Um, and let me give you an example. As for an example, this is a good example. This is the same steel. This is at um, 80, uh, 80 Kelvins, uh, K is in Kelvins. And you can see how this material actually failed at 80 Kelvin. It's, it's, a, it's a brittle fracture. In this case, the same steel, and I'm at 300K, you can see that actually break. It, it actually broke. Uh, and, the, uh, and the way it broke is more ductile fracture. The same specimen, different temperatures, and you can see the behavior of them. Um, so mainly brittle fracture it, it just uh, you know it gets to a point and very quickly fails uh in, in a pop in you just do like this and fails but then ductile materials they have a little bit more tolerance to to they can handle a little little bit more uh plasticity if you would and then this region here many times we actually in many applications we design so that uh, how much time this what will be this plasticity? We can design uh, parts to deform plastically if we wanted to. Um, so that leads up to the topic of stress concentrations. 
So almost everything that we do, uh, we have some sort of stress concentrations. You can see you can have stress concentrations here. You can have stress concentrations here. In this particular case, you can see how failure occurred here in the pin. There was a pin that goes here. And that type of failures occur all the time. And that's because of this location right here that has high stresses. To better understand what happens in this type of problem, consider this. So um, if I design something like this and you think about the flow, think of the water that is flowing over this, which actually nice that the water we have stresses. And then going there, they're hitting this wall, and then they create these high peaks. So if I was going to plot the stresses there, the stresses there are actually what they do is the, the, the stress uh, the stresses here may look something like this. You might have a something stressed like this, and they peak up, and then they can come back down. So these peaks are really not good in this location right here. We don't like them. One of the things we can do to avoid that is add a very nice fillet. These nice fillets are a, a nice trick in which we can let this flow not let the uh, your stress lines flow very nice and smoothly. Uh, in aerospace structures, uh, typically we like fillets of one uh, a eighth of an inch. Many times you go as high as quarter inch. And maybe other application, maybe even higher. But typically this is where we like to be at or maybe go higher. Um, so if uh, I was going to design something, I had three options, right? One of the options is, um, this is a very poor option. We don't like this. And you can see the stress ratio is right here, very tight. This is a good option, um, not the preferred, but it's very good. So this is what uh, many times we do. Nowadays, all our I-beams are integrally machined. Um, so if you have an I-beam, uh, you always want to make sure that you have a fillet radius here. Uh, as I just mentioned to you, of at least 1.25 inches, right? And that could be a case like this, okay? Now, this case, you can see that what's happening is your fillet comes all the way from here to there, opposed to only starting maybe halfway. Um, so this is a much preferred option. Another alternative option is put some small stress concentrations around this. So now you're, you will never have stresses here in the first place. So the stresses are bumped up and they will actually go here in a smoother fashion. So these two options are our preferred option. This is acceptable. This is not. Okay, You never want to do this. Uh, you want to stay away from this option. Uh, like doesn't matter. Whatever you do, just stay away from it. This is the alternative to this option or this is a preferred. If that cannot be... Uh, achieved then try one of these try this option otherwise then at least this this option could be acceptable another case we are talking about shafts when you design shafts is something is very unique right and what happens with shafts is um, you have these stress concentrations there but we do many tricks to the shaft the first thing we can do is we can uh, add a, a cut here that looks something like this. And you can see how that small cut, what it does is it takes the stress lines, uh, these flow lines, and pushes these flow lines underneath this. Uh, and, sorry, it just pushes these stresses underneath that and avoids the problem that you're really, you know, that that's going to cause. Um, another case is. Hey, just put a shoulder groove, okay? This helps uh, in the sense that you can also see how your stresses are pushed down thanks to the, the, the groove. And, and now you have some smooth lines, which we also like. Another option could be uh, put a larger, uh, large radius relief right here underneath this. This is also a very good option in which helps you this uh, this flow to be actually smooth and nice. So these are any of the uh, mounting considerations that you can have 
but there's still, regardless of whatever you do, you have to consider that this was taken into effect and there still would be some stress riser, right? So the question is, what do we do with those stress risers? How do we go about that? So think about this case. Um, I got, uh, these are small final element models and you can see how at a glance it looks like, oh, we are just fine, but when you zoom in, you see the stress risers there. And these are, these are the guys that actually give us, can break your part right here. And, and the question is, how do we handle them? How do we consider them? So let's define stress concentrations as follows. These are nothing else than localized stresses. Nothing else than localized stresses. Uh, that are considerably they're considerably higher than average. This is important considerably. Due to abrupt change in geometry. Or localized loading. Okay. These stress concentrations are also called stress risers or stress raisers okay there are different names for this depending on the book you use or the engineering firm that you work with and typically the way we uh, uh, notate the stress risers is by a stress concentration factor and we call it K. So this is a stress concentration factor. Okay, uh, we are gonna call this one static stress concentration factor. Okay. Then later we will talk about what we do in fatigue and how this is actually, how it behaves in fatigue. So, so to understand how to find this K, this is typically, you have a stress, right? Your new stress, your new stress would be this KT multiplied by my nominal stress, right? This is a stress, assuming that there was no raised stress raiser, multiplied by that and that does the trick. Now, listen, we here in engineering, we constantly are finding ways to simplify our lives. We do lots of testing, lots of data, and through that data, we just say, hey, can I take a problem that I know I multiply it by a factor, and that's it. So all the way we learn MC over I, uh, M over Z, T over Q, P over A, B over A effective, all that can be still be used just multiplying by a stress concentration. And by multiplying that factor, that greatly simplifies your entire analysis instead of having to, go, having to constantly go and, and, and use elasticity equation or finite element models to approximate what happens in that small corners. Okay, so let's consider a simple case. Let's say that you have an area. So if I was going to find the stresses in this location here, the stresses in these locations are nothing else than sigma is P over A. I think we can all agree. And if I'm choosing a point, you know that over the entire cross-section it will be exactly the same, right? Now, let's take the same problem and let's actually uh, make a hole to it, okay? So now we apply this hole, the same problem, same location, and, and you can see I'm going to have less stresses, right? So let's see what happens. So now here in this location, 
my new stresses, okay, my new stress will be P over uh, my new AT. AT is nothing else than P. Uh, I have my, uh, my distance is uh, my H multiply B minus D. So as you can see, if you compare this to the nominal stress, the nominal stress was P over BH. And what you can see is immediately this is smaller, you see? This is just the distance B and this becomes smaller. If this is smaller, then this becomes larger. Okay, that's the whole idea of stress raisers. And so we have done lasso testing, lasso testing, and what, the, what it does, it says, what it does, it says, can we just possibly keep this identically the same? And then my new stress we just multiplied by a K. So I don't have to worry about doing all this true stresses, etc., etc., and I can just move on. Well, actually, the good thing is it, we do have that. We do have that. And for that, what we do is for, for an axial load, right? For the axial load, let's call axial. What we do is your new axial load will be the axial load is going to equal to KT multiplied by the axial load that you calculate in the problem. Okay, so this is uh, this is what happens to your axial load. You just multiply by KTA. That's what I'm going to call it. For your bending, then you have a different uh, factors for bending. B in bending will be sigma XXB. Then this is bending again. This is KB in bending and sigma XXB. We can also have this in torsion. Okay, lots of testing is done for torsion itself. So torsion, as you know, depends on XY or XZ. So we will leave it like that. And then your torsion stress will be KTS. Okay, we call it S in terms of uh, uh, S in shear. And what happens in this problem is, and for shear, we don't have any. Okay, there, there's no stress concentration factors. No KTV. Okay, we don't have that. So where nothing else than sigma XXA is nothing else than your axial load divided by area, uh, sigma XXB is nothing else than your M divided by Z, and your tau T is nothing else than T divided by Q. Okay? Then again, these are stresses that we always know at the critical location. Remember, we are doing everything at the critical point. Okay? So then we, when we move on, uh, we have tables, if you go in your textbook, um, in Appendix A15, and then in these tables, we have many different cases, okay? So consider, consider this table. This is R over D, it got chopped. Um, so you basically have uh, the radius of the fillet divided by your small d, okay? And these are nothing else than big D divided by small d if it's a shack, if this is the case that you're working with. Then what you do is you basically, let's say it's 0.15, uh, let's say it was 0.16, right? You know that this is, it's going to be somewhere like over here. You come all the way up here. And then let's suppose your, uh, as an example, R with D is 0.16, just for just for sake of this argument and show you how the tables work, 1.25. Then you can come over here and you can say, I am somewhere over here roughly, so my value will be here. Then my value will be uh, just about 1.55 if you would, right? This is an eyeballed example. Um, you have what you have to also know is that in the table itself, 
in the chart, you're going to have the value of your nominal area. Okay, yeah, that's important because many times um, I'm asked, what do I use, the larger radius or the smallest? Well, you always use the smallest because you want the highest, uh, you know, you want the largest area. It's the smallest area so you can get the highest nominal stress. Okay, and they have a bunch of tables and data set up for these uh, curves that so you can find them. But uh, many books and many tables actually go and give you this value. And note, note another thing that's very important. This is a round shaft with only tension, okay? So the value that you get here would be KTA, okay? Then if you do this problem, this is pure torsion. It's the same problem, same thing, it's just pure torsion. In this particular problem, then you have KTS, as you can see. And just to show you, you can find your Q as we talked about this in class over C. If you divide these two, you can find your Q. But I was look at what it says here. Um, if it's a case of pure bending, then I call this KTB and note the, what the equation is using. If you want the value of Z, remember Z is nothing than the I over C. You can divide this I over this C and get that value. Um, so this is how all these equations actually work, and this is all the same. This is the case of a fillet, right? You get many other tables in your textbook. Um, let me jump into a few others. Like for instance, you got this other case that's a grooved round bar, and, and I explained to you why we use that, right? Especially just to have the uh, stress concentrations to be uniform. But look at the area that we are using um, D over D and R over D is all the same. This is um, so. If you did this one, you know this is KTA. You were using this table. This is KTB. You're using this table. This would be KTS. You have another uh, another table where if you had a flat bottom groove that looks something like this, right? Maybe this is where your bearing will be located at. So if I did something like this, now this particular table has a combined, and you can see what your nominal stress is. They tell you what your nominal stress is. And you may ask, but professor, I'm getting only one KT. Well, the problem is basically saying that your KTA is actually equal to KTB, and it's actually equal to KT. It's all the same, okay? So if you're running the computer code uh, in MATLAB, then you only want to do is to use the same value for KTA, KTB. That's what this means. Because saying when they did this testing, this table, they did it for a combined set of loading. Okay. So this completely com concludes the first topic uh, of this discussion. Uh, next, we will do a couple of examples on how to find uh, distress concentrations for static loading.